for all those who appreciate the work that we're doing here on Standing for Truth, please hit that subscribe button because we are just getting started. All right, looks like we are live and we've got a lot of good people in the chat already. I hope you guys are as excited as me. Uh, good to see everybody. Redefine Living, my brother, how you doing? Alec Cox, Erica in the house, Honesty Angel, Brandon. Brandon, good to see you. Brandon says, sorry, William Lang Craig, that SFT has to do this to you, but needs to be done. Amen. Hey, we love William Lang Craig. He demolishes the, uh, the atheists in debates. I've probably seen every single one of his debates, but his science and especially this most recent video he's put out in terms of why he believes humans and chimpanzees are related, really exhibits what seems to be William Lane Craig's inability to read creationist literature and to stay up to date on the scientific data. For example, you're going to see and I'm going to play some good clips. We're going to make this interactive, guys. Um, his main argument in the video, okay, this video was put out just a few weeks ago, is pseudogenes. And we're going to talk about that in great detail. I've got some papers that I want to show you guys. I mean, we are going to leave no stone unturned today, guys. Uh, it's, it's the fatal blow to pseudogenes. And theistic evolution essentially. I'm going to read a part from Dr. Jeffrey Tompkins, PhD in genetics, his book, More Than a Monkey. Okay. Just to get this started, just do a brief overview of pseudogenes. One of the evolutionary paradigms falling by the wayside in the wake of new research is the idea that pseudogenes are just broken genes. When scientists first began sequencing the DNA of plants and animals, they began finding gene-like sequences that appeared to have coding errors that would prevent them from making functional proteins. Because these gene-like sequences called pseudogenes were also similar to other genes in the genome that did produce functional proteins, they were dismissed as broken, defunct remnants or genomic fossils. However, scientists have recently discovered that many of these so-called fossil sequences are not pseudo after all. They are required to sustain healthy life processes in the cell. And in the few cases where real broken genes are discovered, they are usually associated with heritable diseases. In the case of the evolutionary poster child for supposed shared mistakes in pseudogenes, the gulo pseudogene, the actual genomic evidence is totally contrary to evolution. So you're going to see, guys, we're going to discuss the fact that what they thought were broken genes are actually functional DNA elements important for healthy life processes in the cell. We are also going to see that genetic entropy is a reality. And therefore, there really are some broken genes a lot of times due to mutational hotspots, areas in the genome that are more prone to damage, more prone to breakage and degeneration. And oftentimes we'll find similar broken genes in different species, of course, because mutational hotspots make these locations in the genome more prone to breakdown. So, uh, and before we get into these videos, I want to point out too, announcement wise, we got a lot of good stuff planned for you guys, more good interviews, debates, discussions. For example, Monday, we're going to have Otangelo here debating patient beard. I've debated patient beard as well as I've had patient beard on to debate Ken Hoven. He's debated the film free. So that's going to be a good debate. Wednesday, I'm pumped. We've got Matt Slick. Okay. Well-known Christian apologist runs the website CARM where you can get a lot of great answers to common questions. He's going to be debating Dr. Ron Garrett, who I appreciate Ron because he's always willing to 
step up and debate and discuss these issues. So they're going to be debating atheism, Christianity, and morality. So I am I'm pumped for that. We've also got a couple roundtable discussions in the works. So guys, lots to look forward to. I, I, I appreciate the support. You guys are the life and blood of this channel. So your amazing support is, is why we're able to put out so much content. I also want to point out, guys, that I'm thrilled to see how well the new book, Special Creation, how, how many people are, are, are getting it and appreciating it and, and getting a lot out of it. So uh, that's amazing. All the glory to God. Please, any questions at any time, let me know. Don't be shy. Andrew Graham says, Slick Matt. Yeah, that's going to be a great discussion. Atheism, Christianity, and morality. Ron Garrett has a couple uh, articles on it, blog posts on it. So that's definitely his uh, cup of tea as well. Windburner says, William Lane Craig has even poor hermeneutical skills. Yeah, we're going to get into his hermeneutics too. Um, you're going to see from his video. He asserts that Genesis is a myth. It's not literal. Okay. I want to point out from my book why human evolution is false. Okay. Before we get into the video itself. Page 11, I point out nobody can defact Nobody can deny the fact that the history recorded in scripture is an uninterrupted and comprehensible historical narrative. This narrative does not end in Genesis, but persists throughout the entire Bible. The Bible is a beautiful record of human history, all starting with the first Adam and ending with the last Adam. The last Adam, Jesus Christ, came to take away the sins of the world. Through his sacrifice on the cross and after his resurrection on the third day, he overcame sin and death. He was the perfect, spotless Lamb of God. And it is only through faith in him that we can find salvation and peace with God. And I've got uh, a number of scriptures quoted from Genesis. But I like to point this out, okay? These biblical compromisers, inspiring philosophy, William Lane Craig, Okay, these theistic evolutions from BioLogos, they want to butcher the text and exhibit poor hermeneutical skills. Okay, they want to deny the fact that Genesis is, is clearly a historical narrative. So I point out, okay, enough with the semantics. Let's now see, okay, whose interpretation is most consistent with the scientific data. Because as I frequently point out, the account in Genesis, the Bible claims to be the history book of the universe. And Genesis makes some very specific claims about human origins, okay, about the global flood, about the Tower of Babel dis dispersal. So let's test those claims to, to science and see if they really are myth. And it just so turns out that the modern scientific data corroborates the account in Genesis, if we take it as a historical narrative, uninterrupted. Isn't that funny? And you'll never see these biblical compromisers debate the science. I would debate any of them anytime. I would love, I would love to see some arguments presented against the scientific data that confirms a literal Adam and Eve. Also, one thing I want to point out, guys, last week was a busy week. A lot of fun. A lot of fun. Dr. Jonathan Sarfati absolutely dismantled biblical compromise once and for all. I mean, he forced inspiring philosophy into early retirement, put it that way. Uh, Ken Hoven gave a great presentation on the flood, the Garden of Eden, followed by a great Q&A. Dr. Rob Stadler was here. He, he gave the fatal blow to abiogenesis and naturalism. Amazing lecture. Amazing. You guys got to have to watch that. Great debate with Bill Morgan. and. As the next week, as the next week comes, we've got a lot of other great shows planned for you. So, anyways, let, let's get right into it. We're gonna play William Lane Craig's video, and then we're gonna address it piece by piece. It's a short video; it's about five, six minutes. Okay, so I'm gonna play it on mute, so you don't hear any echo, and then we're we're gonna address it. This is gonna be fun, guys. So here we go. Let me share screen, and. 
put an end to the bad science and put an end to the bad hermeneutics. Here we go. 32 people. Awesome. Make sure you guys are hitting that like button. Share with your friends and family. We're extremely close to hitting the, the 3K subscribers. And we are planning a, the, an open mic night that's going to be sure to be memorable. And it's going to be a wild 3K subscriber party, guys. So help us get to that 3,000 subscriber mark. Okay, here we go. Now, Dr. Craig, it seems that you would allow for some measure of evolution, uh, given that you've said uh, that I, I've heard you give three kind of stages of human development, uh, if you want to call it human development, uh, of the development of those made in the image of God. There I can't go. remember what the first one was, but then it was Neanderthal and then Homo sapien. Right. So it seems that you would allow for some degree of evolution. But then the fact that you believe in a historical Adam and Eve would suggest to me that you believe the Genesis account that they uh, that they were directly created from God, by God, not sort of evolving from apes mm -hmm. or something like that. Uh, am I representing your view accurately? Yes, uh, I think that it's perfectly possible scientifically that Adam and Eve were de novo creations out of animate materials rather than out of pre-existing hominins. But given that we're dealing here with a mytho history, I'm not at all confident that that's true. In fact, quite the opposite. I, I think that the creation of Eve out of Adam's rib is almost undeniably figurative language. Uh, rather than describing an actual surgery that took place with this rib floating in the air and then being formed into a woman. And even God's creating Adam out of dirt and then blowing into his nose, again, seems to be very, very anthropomorphic and figurative. So I think that the narratives of Genesis 1, given their genre, leave it open as to how God created Adam and Eve. And that makes it a scientific question. And when I look at the question scientifically, I think that the similarities Okay, real quick, I want to uh, play a clip from Dr. Sarfati on whether or not Genesis can honestly and intellectually be taken as a myth, or is it clearly a historical account, an uninterrupted historical account of our human origins? And I also want to point out that these biblical compromisers, they often attack young earth creation with a straw man, okay? They assert that when we say we take the Bible and the account in Genesis literally, okay, they think we are taking it with this unrealistic wooden literalism. No, taking Genesis literally, okay, as it was written and as it has been conveyed means that there was st we're st will still be s symbolisms, okay, figurative language, within the literal text, okay? And, and Dr. Sarfati does a great job here on, our brother Brandon did an amazing job because he put all the relevant timestamps. So if you have not yet seen this video, please do so. I've got it here. I'm gonna share screen again on the audio. And we discuss this very claim by William Lane Craig here about Genesis being myth. And therefore, we can interpret it as either Adam and Eve being de novo creation or being related to the great apes and the chimpanzees and the humans ultimately descending from a common ancestor. So I'm going to play this here, guys. Just one second. Okay. Share the audio. Once again, I'm going to mute myself so you won't be able to hear me, but it's just it's best for sound quality. So here we go. is because we kind of mentioned William Lane Craig earlier. Well, in a recent video that I've seen being shared around, William Lane Craig, he claimed that when you do a... a sensitive genre analysis of Genesis 1 to 11, mm -hmm. it suggests that we are not dealing with a straightforward historical narrative, but word for word, he said it is a mytho history. 
Do you believe there's any legitimacy or validity to this argument from uh, Craig? No, actually, uh, you should look at some of our, in our website. It's not on our website. I pasted it in there just now. Of course, you're probably running a bit behind me, what you're seeing, what the audience is seeing behind me, but uh, placing this in now. And if you search in our search button for Craig, you'll find there are about three articles I've written um, replying to Craig, including that one. And some of my colleagues have responded to Craig more recently. The problem is, um, remember when Peter was evangelizing, he said, we do not follow cleverly devised myths. What we are teaching is history. Uh, but Craig would have us believe that Genesis is a cleverly de de um, devised myth, which I find totally unacceptable because Jesus and the apostles taught it as real history. Uh, when Jesus was warning about the judgment, he went back to the flood narrative. He said, as it was in the days of Noah, and he affirms the flood was real, the ark was real. And then he teaches about marriage as man, one man and one woman, he goes back to Genesis 1, 27 and 2, 24, again, quotes it as real history, a real man and woman that God created at the beginning, not billions of years after the beginning. OK, so every time they refer to Genesis, they, they treat it as straightforward history. They expect their readers to understand it as straightforward history. They expect the readers to have been taught about Genesis in their, uh, the discipleship in the early church. OK, uh, so. Jesus and the apostles believed Genesis was real history, not mytho history. And then the grammar of Genesis makes it very clear that it's meant to be historical and not poetic or allegorical. That's the five consecutives I went through just before, just earlier. Well, while we're on uh, William Lane Craig, Dr. Safadi, um, Awesome. So what I find funny is William Lane Craig wants to say it's a mythos history. OK, when in fact, the apostles themselves, the New Testament writers inspired by God himself and, and Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, they wanted us to take it as a straightforward narrative, as the grammar indicates, as Dr. Sarfati pointed out. But I want to screen share on a couple of these articles that Dr. Sarfati is pointing to. Must read articles, okay? For sake of time, we're not going to go through them all. But I want to point out the fact that your biblical compromisers, they do act like these don't exist. For example, Inspiring Philosophy's latest video, he put forth these arguments as if they haven't been addressed. They've been addressed for 10, 20 years. For example, this one here, Dr. Sarfati himself goes through all of William Lane's Craig's, William Lane Craig's claims, arguments, okay? Craig's claims on the creation days, okay, with Genesis 1. So please check this out. There hasn't been any rebuttal at all from William Lane Craig. And I'm going to post this in the description box, okay? Maybe we'll cover a little bit of this later too, but we still got so much to cover. So this is what Dr. Sarfati is referring to. And you can see every claim that William Lane Craig makes. And then Sarfati's response with a lot of references as well, where you can probably spend an entire day on these articles, okay? Here's another one, too, reviewing John Walton. John Walton reimagines Adam and Eve. Going through the number of claims, okay, from John Walton, who people like Inspiring Philosophy parrot. So we might as well go right to the source, John Walton himself. And, and debunk them and debunk those claims that are being parroted. So uh, let, let, let's continue William Lane Craig's video now. Just one second here. See how the chat's going. No, um, William Lane Craig's not a flat earther, no. Good question. Okay, so let's get to the next part of William Lane Craig's video here on the pseudo genes and let's have some fun. Got some good videos to share for you on that one, too. How's the audio, guys? Let me know. That human beings exhibit genetically to chimpanzees, particularly broken genes that we and chimpanzees both seem to have inherited from the last common ancestors that, that has no function anymore, suggests that we do share an evolutionary origin with 
human beings. And that God used a pre-existing hominin who was non-human and merely animal, not in the image of God, as the stuff, as it were, out of which then he created the first human beings. And this probably involved some sort of regulatory genetic mutation induced by God in these hominins and the creation and infusion of a rational soul into them to make them truly human. So there would be both biological and spiritual renovations required in order to have a genuine human being. Okay. And, and I want to like, uh, so, so that sounds like theistic evolution. Is that, mm -hmm. is that a position that you're comfortable with? I am comfortable, comfortable with it with? biblically. Uh, I, I think that biblically you can't rule it out. The way in which it might differ from theistic evolution is the degree to which I want to appeal to miracles. Theistic evolution often tries to provide a purely naturalistic account of how God brought about biological complexity. Whereas what I'm suggesting is miraculous intervention on God's part to bring about a biological and spiritual renovation of this hominid form that would never have occurred naturalistically if left to it, its own devices. And, and to your point earlier, when you said it's improbable that you see that the, the removal of Adam's rib forms Eve, uh, this is probably just language. You're not saying that God couldn't do that. I mean, you're uh, saying that God can use uh, some kind of, uh, I apologize, I'm not a scientist here, some early monkey ancestor and breathe life into this thing <laughs> and allows, allowed it to evolve. I mean, you, you believe, I, thank you, I appreciate that. But, but I mean, you, you believe that uh, 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 God created the heavens and the earth, so God sure. can do whatever he wants. He said some guy's eye and made him see, but you just see the language as suggesting uh, that, that this is probably a little bit more uh, mythological that, than it is exactly uh, right. impossible for God. Okay. Exactly right, Josh. And I hope that our listeners who are young earth creations today don't take the easy way out of accusing me of anti-supernaturalism and right, right, being right. against miracles because that would be a gross misrepresentation of my position. Of course God can do these things. My claim is that when you do a sensitive genre analysis of Genesis 1 to 11, it suggests that we're not dealing here with a straightforward historical narrative, but with a mytho history. Okay, before we get to the several videos that I've lined up, we've already demolished that claim that it's a mytho history and not to be taken as a historical narrative. Okay, we've also touched on the fact that when we take it as a historical narrative, we can test those claims to the scientific data. And it just so turns out that we have literally discovered the mother of us all in our genetics. We've discovered the father of us all in our genetics. And it fits perfectly where we would expect them to be if Genesis were true. And I've never seen William Lane Craig rebut that, nor has he rebutted these articles that I showed on screen just moments ago. He also says that we would take the easy way out when, in fact, it's William Lane Craig and the biblical compromisers who take the easy way out by not updating themselves on the scientific data. And that's why typically they will not debate the scientific data. Inspiring philosophy would not debate the topic of independent origins versus universal common ancestry, okay? Take his butchering of the Genesis account, take his lack of skills when it comes to hermeneutics, okay? Take my accurate interpretation of Genesis. Now let's see if his interpretation or my interpretation is most consistent with the scientific data. And that is why they cannot address the evidence coming from genetics, okay, that demonstrate a literal and scientific Adam and Eve, or geology that demonstrates a global flood. Okay, so that is a debate that typically you won't see them engage in. And one debate that I would recommend, and we're going to show a clip from it, is Dr. Jensen of Answers in Genesis versus Dr. Venema, who used to work for BioLogos, where they do debate the science. And it was a knockout win for Dr. Jensen in that debate. Four and a half hours long, and you see both sides, and you cannot come away from that debate without quickly realizing that the evidence is extremely powerful for young earth creation. So what's funny is William Lane Craig, as we touched on in the beginning, I went over a few quotes on pseudo genes and how they've been overturned. Okay. And how the broken genes though, that we do find that are actually broken and not essentially functional DNA elements is evidence for genetic degeneration. What type of, what type of mechanism would William Lane Craig present us with? 
okay, that can filter out all of these low impact deleterious mutations that are accumulating from generation to generation, slowly degenerating our information systems. You won't find an answer to that, okay? And what's funny is you'd think that these biblical compromisers would want to address our best arguments by simply saying, hey, we've got broken genes, we've got broken genes in humans and chimps, and therefore we must have inherited them from a distant common ancestor, doesn't address the fact that what they thought were pseudogenes a lot of the times turn out to produce RNAs that actually increase, they're functional, they increase the expression of their corresponding functional genes, okay? We've also found out that, and uh, Dr. Sarfati is going to point this out, in that they've assumed that most of the genome is junk because less than 2% of the DNA actually codes for proteins. But the more that they've studied the DNA code, the more that they've studied the genome, they've quickly realized that these non-protein coding RNAs, okay, regulate virtually all aspects of the gene expression pathway. And I mean, I can go into introns, okay, the functions for intron, introns, the ERVs, other classes of retrotransposons, we could get into orphan genes, okay? Specifically, we're going to talk about pseudogenes, since that is William Lane Craig's main argument here, okay? Now, when it comes to the pseudogenes as well, when it comes to actual broken genes, okay, the fact is genetic entropy, genetic degeneration is a reality. We're living on the same planet with these organisms, okay, and we're subject to common environmental problems, and therefore we would expect common problems in the genome as well, especially when it comes to parts of the genome okay, that are more susceptible to mutations, okay? We could call these mutational hotspots. Just because my Honda Civic and my Chevy Cruze, okay, just because the air conditioner broke in the same way in the same spot doesn't mean that they inherited this problem from a skateboard ancestor billions of years ago. It's ridiculous, okay? common problems due to common environmental conditions. But I want to also point out the fact that we have a lot of preliminary biochemical evidence for function of the pseudogenes that we don't necessarily know exactly what their function is. Okay? This is due to the ENCODE data. And I've pointed out numerous times that many of these non-coding RNA genes, such as pseudogenes, they're only expressed under certain conditions. So when you're testing, for example, mice in the lab, those laboratory conditions are static, okay? As compared to in the real world, where a lot of these non-coding RNA genes would actually be expressed. Therefore, if you knocked it out, there would be an immediate effect, okay? So the fact is, the pseudogenes, as we indicated earlier, they're now known, if you were update, updated on the science, to be functional DNA elements and not actually mistakes. Essentially, the entire junk DNA paradigm, guys, has been completely overturned, okay? And the evolutionists try to play this off like they've always predicted DNA function. Now, here's what's funny. Richard Dawkins, okay, and I'll read this quote. Richard Dawkins in 2009, he stated, okay, it is a remarkable fact that the greater part, 95% in the case of humans, of the genome might as well not be there for all the difference it makes. Do you see how evolutionary theory and this thinking of naturalism, okay, because they would essentially expect the genome to be littered with genomic fossils, the ancient remnants of viral infections, evolutionary leftovers, okay? So they don't expect treasure in the genome as we would expect. Because as we, as we often point to, we start from the position that God created Adam and Eve and all the different kinds of animals. Why would he create their genomes to be 90% junk? 
No, clearly when God said, be fruitful and multiply, that would not be done and carried out through cloning. So we would hypothesize, of course, that God front loaded Adam and Eve and the created kinds with functional DNA elements and functional DNA differences. And that's exactly what we find. Well, the evolutionists are on the opposite side. You saw Guts a Given recently in her debate claim that over 80% of the genome is junk, okay, which hinders science. Because after Richard Dawkins himself realized that junk DNA is dead, in a debate with Jonathan Sachs, years, years later, okay, years before in 2009, he said, most of the genome, 90%, 95% of the genome may as well not be there, which is funny. I wonder if Richard Dawkins would knock out 95% of his genome. Let's see if there's any effect after that, Richard Dawkins. He then said years later, I know there are some creationists who have jumped on it, okay, the, the, the newfound functions that we've discovered, because they think it is awkward for Darwinism. Quite the contrary, of course. It is exactly what a Darwinist would hope for, to find usefulness in a living world. Here's what's funny. Years before, he was saying, ah, over 95% of the genome may as well not even be there, useless junk. And now, and now he's acting like this is not what he believed. This is not what he purported. He's saying this is exactly what a Darwinist would expect to find, okay, which is not actually being honest with the data. Um, before I continue, because I do want to screen share some papers for the evolutionist critics who think I'm just making this up. But before I do, I want to play another clip real quick from our Sarfati interview, where we also asked him this direct question from William Lane Craig. Just one second, guys. One yeah. of these other main arguments for his claim that humans were probably not specially created by God as a result of um, being, unrelated, uh, being unrelated to great apes, is that mm -hmm. humans and chimpanzees share broken genes or genetic mistakes. Is there any validity to his argument as it is enough for us to reject the independent origins of Adam and Eve in the beginning of creation? Well, the point is, I mean, he seems to be very behind in genetics because at one time uh, people thought there uh, was 97% junk DNA, but now they know that junk DNA is doing something. It's been transcribed into RNA, which is very important to regulate genes. So when 97% of it's actually transcribed and they can prove it's transcribed, it's not junk, it's doing something. It's part of the uh, immensely complicated genetic coding system that we have. That's what the junk, the so-called junk is doing. And also there are some spots in the genome which are a bit more prone to uh, mutations than other spots. So that's why we have, uh, that if in fact it is a mistake, and that's what I'm not necessarily going to agree with him on, if it is a mistake, there are some places which are more prone to mutations than others. So that's what you've got there. Uh, what's the usual thing, the gulo gene for uh, vitamin C production, that's supposed to be a shared mistake. Now, we wrote about shared mistakes quite some time ago, so I'm surprised he hasn't really caught up with the, needs to get with the program, really. I'm, uh, I'm, just wondering, I'm just wondering where he gets his information from and whether he looks at both sides of the story. He doesn't look at our side of the story. That's the problem. He, he seems to have into my business commentary where he can try and... Uh, pull something out of context and say there's something wrong there, which I've actually answered in another part of the commentary. That's what he's done. And in the same way that he's this, um, this firing philosophy, he knocks down straw men all the time. We're going to have an article responding to that on, on creation.com in, in a few days as well. Because again, he uh, the honest thing to do with a position is to try to address the strongest arguments for it. They don't seem to do that. Well, well uh, it's him why we do that. We, we actually address Richard Dawkins, leading evolutionist atheist. We address Hugh Ross. Right. So that's what we do, is we address the strongest arguments that they throw at us, okay? But they ignore the strongest evidence that we have for our position, as well as the strongest rebuttals we have provided to them in regards to their arguments, the way William Lane Craig, just three weeks ago, you know, 2020, 
just throws that out there as if it's such convincing evidence that humans and apes are related through common ancestry. Well, clearly we would expect, okay, similarities when it comes to broken genes, of course, okay? We live in the same world, we experience the same problems. But at the same time, that argument exhibits the, a fact that that person using the argument is not quite up to date on the scientific data, okay? Here's a paper, I'm gonna screen share. Actually, before I do, I'll check the chat. Awesome, got a good chat going today. Um, awesome, lively chat, good to see everybody. Nephil and Free, good to see you here, brother. Okay, I'm going to screen share uh, a couple papers here, okay, on pseudogenes. Here we go. Here's a good paper right here. This isn't from a young earth creation source, you know, for the evolutionists. This is the secular literature, you know. And you'd think if William Lane Craig is using this argument, he'd at least point out that, hey, the intelligent design advocates, okay, the biblical creationists, they do point out the fact that these pseudogenes, okay, a lot of the times turn out to be functional DNA elements, important for healthy life processes in the cell. But, you know, we could say that this is just a reduced function or a co-opted function which is no more than a rescue device, guys. But at least give the other side's argument because to be honest with you, then he just makes this too easy to debunk and refute, okay? It just shows that, that he hasn't updated himself on the scientific literature. Now I wanna point out, the evidence suggests, okay, that the far greater portion of the genome is active to some extent. Now, we haven't done comprehensive knockout experiments on mammals, okay? Now, we have done them on mice. But as I said, they have knocked out genes in mice where there were no apparent effects, okay? They reproduce fine. But this is simply basic genetics in the fact that a lot of these non-protein coding RNA genes, and since we're talking about the pseudogenes, specifically the pseudogenes, they're only expressed under certain conditions. And all of these developmental windows, you've got genes being turned on and off, where a lot of the times specific genes are turned off, okay? And then they're relocated, okay, for a different purpose during the life of the organism, maybe waiting to be turned on through some environmental condition, environmental factor. We've got millions of genetic switches in the genome just waiting to be turned on or off via the environment you know this is forward thinking mechanisms requiring a forward thinker okay so here's a uh here's a page now i want to point out there is a recent paper because erica claimed that they've done all these knockout tests okay and and i pointed this out in my several debates with her okay that they've done all these knockout tests and there were no detrimental results well that's just that's just false They've recently done some genetic knockout sequences. And I showed the paper during our last open mic night. We had Nephilim Free here. We had a lot of great people here where we debunk claims from the evolutionists on junk DNA where they did knock out genes and it turned out to be detrimental to the mice in a number of different important cell tissues, okay? So the fact is, no, they are knocking out genes in the mice and it's turning out to be detrimental. Now they haven't done knockout experiments on humans, right? It's unethical for obvious reasons, but um, as science advances and we can figure out different ways to test the genome and test genome function, the creationists are saying that all of this activity in the genome, it's not just spurious, okay? It's not just useless activity. It's there for a reason, okay? And that's the most plausible and parsimonious explanation. The evolutionists want to say it's there, okay? It's activity, but it's not useful activity. It's spurious. Okay, I've debated CRISPR numerous times, and that's typically what he points out. Yeah, we're looking at 60 to 80% activity in the genome, biochemically speaking, but it's just spurious, okay? But here's the thing. The cell is not going to transcribe all of that useless junk that's not useful or helpful to the organism, 
okay? Because it's a waste of energy. It's a waste of resources for the cell to do such a thing. And uh, Brother Nephilim Free made a great point in the fact that they want to purport that we evolved, okay, from a single cell like ancestor billions of years ago, okay, which essentially evolved into a multi-celled organism, into a fish, amphibian, reptile, mammal, bird, monkey, man, okay, fish to fisherman evolution, which required a lot of novel and meaningful information, a lot of novelty, new body plans, new body structures, okay? And yet, evolution can take a fish to fisherman or a bacteria-like organism into a biologist, but it can't remove all of this useless junk. You know, that's pseudoscience, that's philosophy. It's active, okay, 80% 80, 80 active approximately for a reason, for a purpose, okay? And that's why we can make specific predictions. Dr. Nathaniel Jensen, he's looked at specific DNA positions and he says, hey, you knock this out, okay, through experiments of mutogenesis, you know, it's going to have this effect or it's going to have this effect. We're going to see this function, that function. Prediction after prediction on paper by the creationists. Zero predictions from the evolutionists other than, sure, 60 to 80% activity, but eh, it's not, it's not useful. It's not helpful to the organism. You know, just, just pseudoscience. We should expect treasure in the genome as compared to junk. It's like throwing a kid in front of a car, opening the hood, a kid who's five years old, and saying, remove anything you see that you feel has no function, that's, that's useless. He's going to start removing everything. He doesn't know what it does, right? He's a kid. He's not educated on it. That's how it's like with us. We understand so little of the DNA language. Okay, so... Um, so here's this paper I want to cover for a little bit. Uh, sorry about the rant. Let me see. Make sure that the chat's good. My audio is okay. Good to see you, Dell. Praise I am that I am. Lena Powell. Great chat today. Okay. So here's a paper everybody should read. Pseudogenes, pseudo-functional or key regulators in health and disease. I wonder if William Lane Craig is aware of this. Pseudogenes, and remember, this isn't a creationist source. Source. Not that creationist sources are bad. I am constantly reading creationist technical papers. You know, you should see my library of technical papers. I believe we need to stay up to date on both sides. Okay, so here we go. Pseudogenes have long been labeled as junk DNA, failed copies of genes that arise during the evolution of genomes. And what's funny is this reads almost like an article on creation.com, but it's it's funny because the second you provide the critic or, or skeptic with an article from a creationist website, suddenly they want to scoff. When the fact is, I've read so many secular papers, you know, and I constantly reference the latest data and research coming out from the Y chromosome and how dissimilar the Y chromosome is between chimpanzees and humans. When you consider overall size differences, gene content, overall architecture, it turns out that the chimpanzee Y is less than 35% dissimilar to the human Y chromosome. How is that possible? When every single human Y chromosome on this planet is nearly identical and can be traced back to one human Y chromosomal ancestor just a few thousand years ago. How does William Lane Craig address that? How does inspiring philosophy address that? Because I've only had two actual rebuttals coming from Guts at Gibbon and Tony Reed in a comment section. And for both of those rebuttals, I've done a two to three hour video response to both. And there hasn't been any responses to those responses. They don't have any explanation for it, guys. Okay, the Y chromosome data, the mitochondrial DNA data, it has actually defeated evolutionary theory. They got nothing. Their best have tried and they've failed. And that's why the theistic evolutionists, of course, they're not going to try. You know, let's see uh, Inspiring Philosophy come out with a video explaining the Y chromosome data that suggests we have come from one Y chromosomal ancestor in the not so distant past who is nothing like the chimpanzee. That's science. So let's keep reading. Actually, I want to see the chat how my audio is. Awesome. We've got 40 people in the chat. Make sure to click that like button. And Brother Neff, great job in your after show. 
demolishing atheism. Neff can take on 10 atheists at once and they still don't stand a chance. Neff is never phased. Okay, so let's keep going. However, recent results are challenging this moniker. Indeed, some pseudogenes appear to harbor the potential. Now remember, the atheists will say, see, it only says some. Yeah, that's because, that's because further experiments are required since a lot of the evidence we have for function is biochemical. Okay, we still need to do extensive knockout tests. We still need to do a lot of experiments to see exactly what the function is. But the biochemical activity to anybody with a brain should indicate function. That's why the, tra the trajectory suggests genome-wide functionality. And that's why we can make specific predictions that, hey, in the future, when we do more extensive genomic testings in regards to function, we are going to find more and more important functions. Well, the evolutionists are essentially saying the opposite, although not really putting it on paper, because then they will have egg on their face, as they always do, when we do find more and more function. Recent results are challenge, challenging this. Some pseudogenes appear to harbor the potential to regulate their protein coding cousins. Remember I said that at the beginning? Not just making this up. This is where I get it from. Far from being silent relics, many pseudogenes are transcribed into RNA. Some exhibiting a tissue-specific pattern of activation. Okay, guys, we've got DNA to RNA to protein, okay? The atheists, the naturalists, they have a very unsophisticated view of this process. They think that you go from DNA to RNA to protein, and your protein, being the end product, is what's functional to the genome. No, the sophisticated view is the fact that you can go from DNA to RNA, and these non-coding RNAs have a variety of functions that are regulating virtually all aspects of the gene expression pathway. Okay, it's like a huge control panel. Okay. And oftentimes, those non-coding RNA genes are helping with the function, okay, of, of the protein coding counterparts. It's like watching a play on stage where you've got the actors and actresses on stage. But then you've also got the behind-the-scenes guys, okay, that have written the script, the director, the producer, the ones working the lights, the ones working the sound, the ones that you can't really see when you're watching the play. But without them behind the scenes, you wouldn't have the play itself that you're watching with the actresses and the actors, okay? There's a lot of behind the scenes work. And that's oftentimes what you see, okay? When you get your DNA transcribed in RNAs, that's what you see a lot of your behind the scenes functions, okay? It's not just DNA transcribed into RNA translated into protein, and then the protein is your and functional product. Yeah, that's function too, but most of the function is coming from your DNA transcribed in RNA, okay? So it's a very unsophisticated view that these evolutionists have had and still have. Far from being silent relics, many pseudogenes are transcribed in RNA, some exhibiting a tissue-specific pattern of activation. Pseudogene transcripts can be processed into short interfering RNAs that regulate coding Coding genes, just like I just said, through the RNA pathway. In another remarkable discovery, it has been shown that pseudogenes are capable of regulating tumor suppressors and oncogenes by activating as microRNA decoys. Isn't that amazing, guys? How often do you hear the evolutionists speaking of this? You didn't hear William Lane Craig speaking of this. The finding that pseudogenes, so let's say we do have a functional DNA element that's hit by a mutation. We're accumulating 100 new mutations per person per generation, okay? Most of these being effectively neutral, low-impact, deleterious mutations. They hit a functional DNA element. They hit a, 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 a gene, okay, that's important, like these pseudogenes, and it damages it. It breaks it. And that same thing happens to a chimpanzee or the same thing happens to a dog or a fish. Okay, yeah, we're going to have similar spots in the genome that are broken, okay, because we're living in similar environments. But overall, they're functional DNA elements, which is exactly what we would predict, okay? Which means the mutational hotspot hypothesis makes a lot more sense of the data than just saying 
through an unsophisticated argument, an uninformed argument that, hey, these broken genes, non-functional, we inherited them from a common ancestor, end of story, ponds come to people evolution, believe it, it's science. No, no, unsophisticated argument right there. Um, let me check the chat. Okay. Smitty, a.k.a. Bill Tavis. I still don't see any argument. He says, why J-E? Not sure what that means. Mutations don't all accumulate. Yeah, a lot of mutations are removed through natural selection. The ones that natural selection can see, natural selection can't see the effectively neutral mutations that are then subject to genetic drift. Natural selection ain't getting to those ones. They're building up over time. And guess what? The more functional our genome is, the more deleterious these mutations are. That's why the evolutionists need to, okay, like Dodgeball Dan, they need to maintain a genome that is less than 20% functional, less than 10% functional. So all of those deleterious mutations that are accumulating from generation to generation can hit the spots that are junk then they'll say the junk areas absorb the mutations and they build up as some kind of hidden reservoir for evolutionary advancement in the future where they can then be called upon, okay, to become functional somehow to the cell and the organism, okay? It's all philosophy contradictory to the data. So let's keep going. The finding that pseudogenes are often deregulated during cancer progression warrants further investigation into the true extent. Look at the true extent of pseudogene function. Isn't this funny? This is coming from a secular paper. And creationists are agreeing that what we find in terms of the functional pseudogenes and the biochemical activity for these pseudogenes in the genome, we are confident enough that these genomes of living organisms are designed and front-loaded in the beginning. The front-loaded hypothesis makes a lot more sense, especially considering the fact that abiogenesis and chemical evolution, okay, and origins of life is a total flop. And I challenge any critic to go through our videos, our number, our extensive number of videos demolishing abiogenesis. We just had Dr. Rob Sadler here who put the fatal blow to abiogenesis. It, it can never be refuted. It can never be touched. And in the Q&A part, I made sure to ask all the typical, most common arguments for abiogenesis and against our position that's saying, hey, listen, the scientific data has demonstrated that any type of origin of life scenario is impossible, okay? People like Dan Dan, the pseudoscience man, he wants to scoff at created heterozygosity, but yet he doesn't even want to try to answer the abiogenesis challenge and the number of chicken and egg problems that abound. No, they believe in pseudoscience. Okay, that's what it is. And people like Dodgeball Dan, okay, they get offended because we call them Dodgeball Dan. Well, then quit dodging all the questions. Quit promoting pseudoscience and you won't get these nicknames, plain and simple. A lot of these evolutionists, they got to get thicker skin, okay? Because if they're going to push these types of arguments that have been demolished for years and years, well, they're going to get oftentimes some pretty aggressive rebuttals. And those aggressive rebuttals that they get are never addressed. They're ignored. They're ignored. We have a number of videos out demolishing abiogenesis. Not one response. Not one response. In the future, we'll get an answer. No, no. The stairway to life, Dr. Stadler made it clear, the more we discover about the genome, the more stairs that are going to be added, the more problems, not the less. Let's see. Bill Tavis. Still no argument. Oh, Renwell, good to see you. Good to see you. My good man, always a pleasure. He says, the article I mentioned to SFT, um, I can't remember what article it is, but I'll be happy to look at it. Um, useless, yeah, 
they'll say like with vestigial structures, they'll say, okay, fine. But here's the thing. It's, it's a failed prediction because a hundred years ago, they had a list of over 140 useless structures, apparently vestigial structures, no functional, non-functional. But then we discovered that their so-called vestigial structures and organs actually do have an incredibly important function. So then they, redefined vestigial organ. They redefined it by saying, well, it's an organ that has a reduced function of its original function or it's co-op, it's co-opted a new function. You know, this is, this is philosophy though. It makes more sense that they're functional because they were originally designed and due to genetic degeneration over time, we inherit deleterious mutations. Okay. Which occur at the, at the, level of the genotype and ultimately manifest in the phenotype and we can get damaged organs and structures and so on and so forth. So that makes the most sense. Okay. We don't have to redefine. Um, so let's see, look at this, Th this entire paper. Okay. While some pseudogenes are transcriptionally silent, others are active raising the question of whether their non-coding non transcripts are a spurious use of cellular energy or instead harnessed by the cell to regulate coding genes. It makes so much more sense, guys, that these are being kept around, okay? They're being kept around not because they're spurious or useless or unhelpful to the organism. No, they're kept around because they are critical to regulating right here. Evidence suggesting that non-coding RNAs play a critical role in regulating genomic function. Um, yeah, so definitely read this one. And you'll see why we can make, we're the ones making the predictions, okay? Now I wanna show another clip real quick, actually. This clip is from the Jackson Wheat debate, Jackson Wheat versus Dr. Kevin Anderson. And Dr. Kevin Anderson, provided some great papers and a great argument in rebuttal to pseudogenes to show that if you want to still hold to this junk DNA paradigm, if you want to still hold to this paradigm that says we are riddled with genomic fossils, okay, well then get ready to have egg on your face. Get ready to have egg on your face as the evolutionists have in the past when it comes to ERVs, retro, the, all these subclasses of retrotransposons, ALUs, introns, non-protein coding RNAs uh, in general, okay? So, you know, <laughs> Bill, Tav Bill Tavis is, is hilarious because he just says things that I've never seen anywhere. Like he just said up here something about Genesis 1 is abiogenesis. Yeah, is, is Genesis 1... Is Genesis 1 the type of abiogenesis that the naturalists are trying to push? No. And Bill Tavis claims to be a Christian, okay? And I'm not doubting that. But here's the thing. He has to then acknowledge that if God created Adam and Eve, okay, it makes no sense theologically and scientifically for God to have created Adam and Eve genetically homogeneous. Yeah, God said be fruitful and multiply, but he really meant be fruitful and clone yourselves. No, abiogenesis is a fraud. It's, it's already destroyed. I'm sorry. It's done. We've got a number of videos and interviews from PhD scientists who have demolished it with no response from anybody. Okay. Therefore, it makes most sense theologically and scientifically that God front loaded Adam and Eve with functional DNA differences. Okay. He front loaded Adam and Eve with genetic diversity that is beneficial and helpful, okay, for variation, adaptation, okay, and change. My wife and I could theoretically have a million kids and every single one of those kids would be different because we have built in nuclear heterozygosity, okay? We have built in genetic variation. We have about 3 million DNA differences worldwide, with the common DNA differences, you've got about 10 million. Throw between 10 and 20 million into Adam. And then you got the flood where you've had a reduction in some of that original heterozygosity. And you're still left with 10 million that we see today, which can explain all the genetic diversity we see in the world today. That is more scientific 
than this fraud known as abiogenesis. Right. So Smitty doesn't realize how illogical the theistic evolutionist position is. He said he never said they were clones. Exactly. So then you have to admit that God would have front loaded Adam and Eve with genetic diversity that would be beneficial and useful. Okay. Which is far more theological and scientific than the naturalist position that says non-living chemicals organize themselves into the first cell. And from that first cell, from that last universal common ancestor of all life, spawned all the life we see today. No, that's not scientific. It's why we see forward-thinking mechanisms in the genome that take us back to the forward thinker, which is the God of the Bible. And the Bible tells us that God created two people. The Bible tells us that after the flood, eight people repopulated the planet. We see this all throughout our genome in terms of allele frequencies. The scoffers always say, well, how do you know which alleles are functional and which ones are due to mutation? Easy, easy. They think this is a knock, knockdown question too. If it's common, if it's functional and it's not disease causing for the most part, then it's created. Okay. If it's non-functional, it's disease causing, then chances are it's a mutation. Plain and simple. Those 10 million common ones around the world, we had Dr. Robert Carter go over this when we had him on, okay? Those are your created ones for sure. Those are the DNA differences that are created. Throw those into Adam and Eve and everything else is explained from there. So I want to go to, let's see, anything else in the chat? I want to address everything. Anything from our good friend, Bill? <clears throat> A question for Smitty. How do you explain the fact that supposedly these genomic fossils, these evolutionary leftovers, these supposed ancient remnants of viral infections, how do you explain their function? And not just low levels of function, but function that is so important, okay, that it's necessary to sustain healthy life processes in the cell. How do you explain that if deep time evolution is true? Let, let, let's see if we can get a... Uh, an answer to that. Anyways, I'm going to share this quick clip from Dr. Kevin Anderson versus Jackson Wheat video. Here we go. That's right. Dr. Anderson, the one that Dodgeball Dan has been running from, been running from for months and months and months. Smitty makes a good point that I've been saying. I don't think anyone fully understands DNA. That's the point. We understand so little of the DNA language. It would be like me going to Russia, okay? And Dr. Jensen makes this analogy and illustration too, and I'm going to play a clip of it. I went to Russia. I was hired as a proofreader. I speak no Russian, okay? I speak, no, I speak one language, English, but I'm hired to be a proofreader in Russia for some books written in Russian. And they want me to point out typos, okay? They want me to point out errors, whatever, you name it. Am I the guy to do that? I don't understand the language, okay? I can't tell you what's a mistake and what's not. And that's how it is in the genome. For years and years, they understand so little of the DNA language where they point to what they believe is a pseudogene or a broken gene or a mutation when in fact that is false and erroneous because they understand so little of the DNA language that in the future, as we have already seen, these turn out to be functional DNA elements and not actually genetic mistakes. That's the point. That's the point. And we're going to play a clip on that too. So, all right. Any more comments, questions, arguments in the chat? You know how we like to leave no stone unturned. Okay, here we go. Or pseudogenes and other supposed junk is not evidence for common ancestry. Initially, it was assumed pseudogenes were broken genes, and if two organisms, for example, human and chimp, shared the same broken gene, they acquired that broken gene from their common ancestor. Yet, as more and more pseudogenes are being found to serve very important functions, along with other so-called junk DNA, 
there's little reason to assume these represent broken genes. If they are not broken genes, then they do not provide evidence of an ancestry. This argument is simply an outdated evolutionary extrapolation. Number five, fossils can be arranged in a variety of ways. As you heard it from there, Dr. Kevin Anderson, the argument from pseudogenes is an outdated evolutionary argument. If they're not actually broken genes, then they're not evidence for ancestry between humans and chimps. Okay. And even in the cases of actual broken genes expected due to mutation accumulation. Okay. That is not evidence for common ancestry. That's evidence for special creation, a creation that has gone downhill due to degeneration and mutation accumulation. So as you can tell, I mean, this is bad. And this is William Lane Craig's video from just a few weeks ago. You know, apparently this is the best they got. This is why we should take Genesis as a history that is myth, essentially, and not a real historical narrative. You know, apparently this is why we should be a biblical compromiser. Yeah, the only ones that are going to be convinced by those arguments, okay, from the theistic evolutionists are the ones that are not up to date on this literature that we've been going over for an hour. You know, there's paper after paper after paper. We just went over one, essentially. <clears throat> okay, I want to do another clip here. Just one second, guys. I'm going to mute myself, share audio. Let me know if audio is still good. find an, an, an analogy in, in DNA, is there genetic evidence that rejects the hypothesis of design? If I'm using design as, as a competing explanation for the data we just looked at, what about at the genetic level? And of course, biologists would cite this. If you look at their genetic evidence, they talk about genetic scars, which again, by its name, uh, implies some sort of error. I'm, I'm not trying to misrepresent them. You'll, you'll see some of the detailed arguments are arguments from function. So what is the function of DNA? How much of the human DNA is functional? Some evolutionists might say, well, maybe 10% is functional. That's all you can argue for. Let's think back to the evolutionary arguments for the appendix, for the, for, the, for the tailbone or the coccyx, for the evolutionary vestige. What was the problem with those arguments? I'd say there were two problems with those arguments. Number one, they're arguments from silence. Absence of evidence is not necessarily evidence of absence. I'll say it again, absence of evidence is not necessarily evidence of absence. It might be, but it might not be. So it's, it's already on a shaky foundation. What makes it even more shaky, and I think a second reason these arguments had faced some, some severe challenges, is the absence of evidence was not derived from decades of experimentation that failed to identify positive evidence for function. The absence of evidence arose from the absence of experimentation itself. So then no surprise, as experiments progress, that evidence of absence disappears and we find evidence for function. So when evolutionists might say there's little evidence for function in the human genome, the first question to ask, of course, is well, what experiments have been done? The gold standard is genetic knockout. Fortunately, that's still considered unethical in humans. We shouldn't be guinea pigs where someone goes into you and tries to knock out your DNA just for knowledge's sake. But there are individuals around the planet that have naturally, because of mutations, because I would say because of the fall, they're missing sections of DNA, or somehow some of their genes have been rendered non-functional. Now, only 6%, I think this is an Icelandic study, only 6% of the genes in the human genome have this sort of individual representation, which means the vast majority of our genes have yet to be tested by the gold standard for function. And since genes represent less than 5% of our total DNA, you can easily see then that the vast majority of our DNA sequence has yet to undergo an experimental manipulation. There's been biochemical studies, that's the you may have for the ENCODE project that they said there was evidence for function in 80% of the genome and it was criticized as being premature. It is premature. It's only biochemistry. It's not genetics. And they're only looking at a, a small subset of cell types. There's all sorts of developmental windows that I did not have access to. And again, you're running into ethical issues here. What are you going to do? How are you going to access a baby in the womb and, and test the function of DNA in those tissues? But I think we have the same problem as we do in anatomy and physiology. Absence of evidence is not necessarily evidence of absence. And the absence of evidence is from absence of experimentation. To me, what the ENCODE project suggests is a trajectory that is pointing towards increasing levels of function. We won't know if that trajectory holds up or not, but it looks to me like the evidence is pointing towards high levels of function in human DNA. And again, that's, that's what it looks like to me. That's a hypothesis that's testable. And I anticipate then that as that level, the evidence for function goes up, uh, the arguments then will have to necessarily change. And let me just pick one example real fast for sake of time. This is the ENCODE project. I'll skip that again. There's a study of pseudogenes. So you can see in the name pseudogene, even the name itself, it sounds like this was a gene that once was and no longer is. It used to be a gene, it's broken. Well, the ENCODE project studied basically every, every single letter in the human DNA sequence. And since there's pseudogenes in the human DNA sequence, it's no surprise these were studied as well. Well, similar experiments have done in, in, been done in other species, including worms and fruit flies. 
And the pseudogenes in these species have also been investigated biochemically for function. And not surprisingly, the number of human pseudogenes that have at least preliminary biochemical evidence for function mirrors what you see across the entire genome, about 80%. And similar numbers, 70-ish percent in, in worms and, and flies also hold true. Again, this is not genetic knockout experiments. It's not the gold standard, but it does set a trajectory. I don't think the evolutionists anticipated this sort of thing. The fact No wonder why your biblical compromisers like William Lane Craig, okay, <clears throat> inspiring philosophy, don't engage the biblical creationists on the science, okay? Because this is how strong our arguments are, which are based on the empirical scientific data, okay? They're not based on evolutionary philosophy. The evolutionary community did not anticipate this much activity in the genome. They did not anticipate the trajectory of genome-wide functionality, okay? Doki Doki Bible Club, good to see you. Thank you so much for the super sticker. I appreciate it. Um, guys, tomorrow we should be having a debate between Otangelo and Patient Beard, which is going to be a lot of fun. And Wednesday, Matt Slick <clears throat> versus Dr. Ron Garrett. So that's going to be a lot of fun too. Godzilla Freak. Made a great point in the chat while this video was going on, and I wanted to find it and share it. Here we go. Godzilla Freak says, think about it this way. If we find a function, we're almost sure. If we don't find a function, we're not that sure. Function will go up with testing, not down. Exactly. Exactly. That's why the trajectory okay, is upward more and more genome function. And that's why we're not shy to put on paper predictions on genome function, specific genomic positions that through mutagenesis will prove to be functional, prove to be disease causing, which indicates function, okay? So that's the trajectory is genome-wide functionality. And here's the thing. We point out, we pointed out the other day, and I want to point it out again, just to leave no stone unturned. When we actually consider, okay, <clears throat> those sequence of events, those incredibly complex sequence of events that changes a single-celled egg, guys, okay, into a complex organism that has hundreds of different cell types, okay? Hundreds of different cell types that are in different organs. And guess what? All of these in the right places, the correct places. And this programming, okay, this direction, this instruction, it has to be somewhere and it turns out that a lot of it is in the so-called junk areas, okay? And there have been reports, contrary to the claims of the evolutionists, there's been reports in mice where they discovered that certain classes of this so-called junk DNA, okay, that comprised, I believe, a third, one-third of the mouse genome, was involved in embryo development. What's really going on step by step down on the molecular level when it comes to these developmental stages, okay? I've pointed out there are so many developmental windows, so many stages in our development, the development of every single organism on this planet where you've got genes being turned on, being turned off, being used. And once they're utilized, once their job is done, then they're turned off. They go into retirement. And maybe during the lifetime of the organism, they come out of retirement to do another job via the environment. There's so many things going on on the molecular level, okay, especially during developmental stages. It's un it, it really is unimaginable to think about how many experiments really need to be done in order to conclude for absolute certainty that, hey, this genetic sequence right here, this has no function. You would need so many experiments based on the fact that so many of these genetic sequences are only expressed and functional under certain conditions. Okay, we have so much interconnectedness going on in the genome. 
so much interconnectedness going on during these em embryological developmental stages. These pseudogenes are important to sustain healthy life processes in our cells. And a lot of these pseudogenes are only turned on and expressed under certain circumstances. And that's why we're confident enough, as you heard Dr. Jensen there, we are confident enough to put on paper very specific predictions that flow from our starting point of design and front-loaded genetic diversity, okay? It's 2021 and it's getting worse for evolutionary theory and naturalism. And it's getting better for biblical creation and independent origins. I don't know how. I rewatched that lecture with Dr. Rob Stadler and it boggled my mind. How could anybody watch that lecture and be an atheist and be a naturalist? It's intellectual dishonesty, okay? <laughs> You know, and that is a lecture that they are going to avoid like the plague because it is going to show them their need for a savior. OK. They have turned their back on the creator that is so evident in the universe, in the genome, in the fact that this naturalistic origin of life, every scenario associated with it is impossible. Doki Doki Bible Club, I appreciate it. William Lame, Compromiser. Yeah, here's what's funny. I'm going to show this clip too. I'm going to save a lot of these clips for a future video. Actually, I'm going to do similar to this one on inspiring philosophy. I just wanted to dedicate this one to William Lane Craig. He got a video all to himself. He should feel proud and honored. Um, and we love William Lane Craig as a brother. He demolishes the atheists in debates. You know, he had a big influence on me before I became a young earth creationist. I just realized that these theistic evolutionists, old earth creationists, they're not up to date on the science. And that's why I'm doing this video. And their arguments from biblical hermeneutics show a lack of skill in interpreting the text. OK, and these straw man arguments from inspiring philosophy, for example, that demand we utilize some type of wooden literalism that ignores figurative language, symbolism, illustrations. It's ridiculous. Um, since Doki Doki Bible Club brought that up, it made me think that William Lane Craig sees a problem where the church all throughout history never saw a problem. Isn't that funny? They never saw the problems that the biblical compromisers see today. And I want to play a clip from Sarfati on that one. Just one sec. So I'm going to share screen, share audio. I'm going to mute myself, guys. So you won't hear me, but I'm going to find the uh, proper spot I want you guys to see on church history. I want to start off with what I believe is, is a very important question then, because we hear it over and over and over again. And I'd love to just dismantle it once and for all, dismantle it for good. Um, many biblical compromisers have claimed that young earth creation is a new invention. <laughs> and they'll say that most of the church fathers, I know I'm, I'm already laughing, most of the church fathers and biblical scholars, they say, did not even believe in young earth creation and that they interpreted the days in Genesis as long periods of time. So my question, Dr. Sarfati, is this true? And if not, what is the best way to deal with these claims and arguments? I mean, always go to the original source. Don't, uh, um, just because Hugh Ross says that someone said this, don't believe it, go to what they actually said. And that's what I did in chapter three of Refuting Compromise, went to the original sources and found that one of them was a young earth creationist, and most of them taught six ordinary days. I, mean, yeah, I went through Basil the Great, uh, who said things like, a, uh, he's doing a commentary on Genesis cre Creation Week, and he says that 24 hours make up the space of a day. And Thomas Aquinas uh, saying um, that the period of light's called a day, because later on, um, a period of 24 hours is called day when it says there's evening and morning one day. So it's just the sort of arguments that we were using is what Thomas Aquinas used, uh, that a day with an evening and morning and number means an ordinary day. Augustine said things like uh, uh, that these 
long age people are deceived by highly mendacious documents that profess to give an age of many thousands of years past. But we know from Moses um, that the world's are under 6,000 years old. You see, they believe that the world was under 6,000 years old at the time of writing. And that's when you go through all these guys. They all believe, you know, you too. Oh, uh, Dr. Sir, I think the, the the last maybe five words you said there kind of cut out. It, it could have been an issue with the with the headset there. But if it was important, I definitely want the audience to make sure that they heard it. Well, that link of this case is just be it shows that even uh, people on, on Hugh Ross's site have said, well, no, there wasn't anyone who believed in, in old earth uh, before about the year 1800. Before then, people believed in a young earth because that's what the Bible said. So right. The, ideas were invented as a reaction to try to appease the evolutionary long age ideas and try to make the bible fit it like they age and gap theory they are 19th century inventions right and then you have the framework hypothesis which is a 20th century invention then you have john walton with his cosmic temple that's in the 21st century so how come everyone overlooked these things throughout history and only just discovered them now when it's so convenient to try to accommodate the millions of years of uniformitarian geology long ages. So right there, fatal blow, fatal blow. What they are accusing us of in the form of a false argument, an uninformed argument, is actually the case with them. OK, framework hypothesis, John Walton and Sentinel apologetics and inspiring philosophy, Michael Heiser, this whole cosmic temple argument, interpretation, 21st century invention, day age, gap theory. These have all been inventions that were foreign to the church fathers, church history. OK, church leaders in the past who use similar arguments or the same arguments that we use as young earth creationists. There's nothing new under the sun. Okay. There's always been these arguments that are, for example, now with, with um, young earth creation, with the theistic evolutionist position, you know, we're addressing the scientific lines of evidence from, uh, from them when it comes to human ape ancestry. But these are all new inventions. This whole argument they use that, that young earth creation was just invented. It's a talking point that they read somewhere, okay? That has no basis in reality, okay? It's not a new invention and it needs to be done away with. I'm sure it's not gonna stop them from repeating it. Okay, I wanna end it with this article here from Evolution News. So we went over this one. Here's a solid paper that you guys should um, have a look at, okay? Um, titled, Pseudogenes, Pseudofunctional, or Key Regulators in Health and Disease. Okay, so we got an article here where it covers the fact that, so let's see. So this is Venema, who essentially who essentially uses the same argument as, as William Lane Craig, okay? So let me see the chat. Does my sound good? Doki Doki Bible Club, I appreciate it. We're going to be doing a separate video on inspiring philosophy as well in the future, okay? So let's see. <clears throat> Venema claims pseudogenes are non-functional. The problem with his argument from pseudogenes, which is the same problem from William Lane Craig, but do you see how thoroughly this argument has been dismantled, but they're still repeating it, is that there is now good evidence that pseudogenes can have a function. Pseudogenes can produce functional proteins, functional RNA transcripts, and even have function if they don't produce a transcript. And look at these paper, number of papers. We looked at one. Um, we saw a couple that Dr. Kevin Anderson presented. I mean, there is, as I said, paper after paper right here. An express pseudogene regulates the messenger RNA stability of its homologous coding gene. All the way back in 2003, they've been finding functions. So there's no excuse, guys. There's no excuse. 
Indeed, the ENCODE project report, reported over 850 human pseudogenes that are transcribed and associated with active chromatin. Of course, there are many supposed pseudogenes in primate genomes for which we have not yet identified any function, which is a beautiful thing, guys, because we have all of this activity, okay, that's clearly not useless, or else the cell would have done away with it, okay? Especially if deep time evolution is true. That's millions of years that the cell's keeping this junk around. That's junk science. Okay? So there's still so much more e experimental data that, that we need to that we need to get. So there's a paper here. The paper concludes that actually I'll read this part. In 2012 in science signaling noted that although pseudogenes have long been dismissed as junk DNA, recent advances have established that the DNA of a pseudogene, the RNA transcribed from a pseudogene or the protein translated from a pseudogene can have multiple. This isn't just low levels of function, guys, something that can be dismissed as being co-opted somehow. Multiple diverse functions and that these functions can affect not only their parental genes, but also unrelated genes. The paper concludes that pseudogenes have emerged as a previously unappreciated class of sophisticated modulators of, DNA, of gene expression. Exactly what I've been saying, guys. Functional DNA elements, okay? Evolutionists are the ones that have named a lot of these genetic sequences and elements, okay? It's better to refer to them as to what the, even these ERVs and these subclasses of retrotransposons, functional DNA elements, that's what they are. And there's many different classes of them, okay? We as creationists have termed a lot of these DNA elements that are important, beneficial, helpful, functional as variation inducing genetic elements, okay? And I cover that a lot in my book, um, Special Creation, which I'm glad to see that a lot of people are enjoying and, and getting use out of. So make sure to pass it around. Here's another paper, 2011 paper, RNA. Pseudogenes have long been, actually this is the paper we went over. RC Pink AL. So have a look at that. I'll put it in the description box. Because a pseudogene may only function in specific tissues, just as we were talking about, guys, and or only during a particular stages of development, their true functions may be difficult to detect. A 2012 paper in RNA Biology notes that pseudogenes were long considered as junk genomic DNA, but pseudogene regulation is widespread in eukaryotes. Guys, pay close attention. They'll say it's one or two, you know, that's Guts of Gibbon's argument, one or two. No, pseudogene regulation is widespread in eukaryotes. Deal with it, evolutionists. The study of functional pseudogenes is just at the beginning and predicts more and more functional pseudogenes will be discovered as novel biological technologies are developed in the future. Just what I was saying, guys. And we're predicting, okay, that the more experimental data and evidence we get, the more Im important functions that are going to be found. When we do careful when we do carefully study pseudogenes, we often find function. Isn't that funny? Because here's the thing. The evolutionists aren't expecting function. We're accidentally finding them. Isn't that funny that we're accidentally finding these functions a lot of the time? Imagine when we're actively and we're motivated to find the treasure. Then we will find more. Okay. Check the chat here. Okay. Great to see uh Renwell, yeah, good point. I was, I was touching on that earlier where I've read papers and articles and watched lectures where the evolutionists, that's what they do. So what it is is uh, the evolutionists will say that this, these mutations are strictly neutral, absolutely neutral. And so they can build up as junk in a sense, okay? So over our million and millions and millions of years of history, okay? 
evolution would predict a lot of evolutionary leftovers, genomic fossils that have built up, essentially neutral to natural selection, okay? So they build up as a hidden reservoir, okay, of genetic variation that can then be called upon for evolutionary advancement and function, okay? That's that, that's their philosophy of it all, okay? Problem is, they have no real experimental data, okay? Showing us the number of necessary mutations that are going to take strictly neutral junk into something as helpful, beneficial, and functional to the genome as we know these pseudogenes are, or we know a lot of this non-coding DNA is. That's, it's like the orphan genes. You know, they can assert de novo gene synthesis all day long, okay, based on their philosophy. But without the demonstration of the number of necessary mutations required for the creation of, of that novel function, then it's just story, it's just imagination. It's more parsimonious that these forward-thinking mechanisms in the genome, these forward-thinking, th these functional DNA elements that scream forward-thinking originated from the forward thinker, the designer. So, and another problem is they assume that all of this junk DNA, okay, is absolutely neutral, strictly neutral. It's impossible to prove that really any genetic sequence is absolutely neutral because essentially, based on what we know about genomics, any change in the nucleotide sequence has to have some effect on genotype at least. And that's the problem, is most of these mutations, they have such small, subtle effects that they're invisible to natural selection, which the evolutionists need for evolutionary advancement. They need them to build up, as Renwell was saying, so good point. But the problem is, they're not so strictly neutral. They're slightly damaging, slightly de uh, deleterious. So yes, they're subject to genetic drift, which is what the evolutionists want in neutral theory, so they build up, but the problem is that which is building up is not as strictly neutral as they say it is. So that which is building up is actually deleterious and detrimental to the organism. So now there is a time problem, okay? Now there's shelf lives on genomes because that which is building up that they need to explain what we see in the genome in terms of genetic switches, genetic function, you know, according to evolutionary theory, those are building up over millions of years, which is going to lead to more extinction, okay, more degeneration. Makes sense according to our model because genomes have only been around for six to 7,000 years, right? So even though we've got a lot of deleterious mutations building up, we're not extinct yet because we haven't been around for millions of years. So, um, let's see. Yeah, so I've read articles on that and papers on that. How some junk can help future molecules form and work. So I guess like, yeah. So it starts off as junk, the evolutionists say. Absolutely neutral, okay? It's built up. It's built up in, in like a closet that's just building up all this junk that eventually can become useful for something. The problem is that which they say is building up actually turns out to be deleterious. Um, so I hope that that helps. Um, so let's see. Um, yeah. So essentially that that's their, and that's why they'll look to when they're, when they're doing their phylogenetic trees and like Dr. Herman Mays, he looks to st statistical hierarchies where he's looking at what's called neutral variation, okay? That variation, which evolutionists explain all genetic variation as the result of mutations over time, right? As we explain most of the variation as 
created variation. So they'll say that variation, which is built up over time, has been neutral to selection, which means we can take that variation that's neutral to selection and compare the genomes of different animals. We can compare the genomes of humans, chimpanzees, the other great apes. We can build these hierarchies based on this neutral variation and we can find hierarchies which evolutionary biologists like Herman Mays would say, statistically speaking, um, demonstrate universal common ancestry. When in the, the fact is, they are assuming that the neutral junk really is strictly neutral junk. For example, third position codon variation, they've always assumed was strictly neutral, okay? When in fact, we now know that third position codon variation is incredibly functional, okay? Where that third position codon is involved in the slowing down or speeding up of cellular processes, or even a mutation there, which would appear to be strictly neutral, will have an overall effect on genotype, okay? So, you know, and we can go down some, some big rabbit trails there. So, um, and that's why functions key, right? Is most of the genome just neutral junk or is most of the genome functional? Those are the two, that's the head to head prediction. That's going to answer this question once and for all. Okay. If we were designed and created, we would expect for the most part, genome wide functionality. The evolutionists would say this has all been a long history of millions and millions of years of evolutionary advancement, okay? So they would predict evolutionary leftovers, genomic fossils, okay? So that's why their arguments from genomics include pseudogenes, ERVs, ALUs, okay, neutral junk. So when I'm debating evolutionists like T-Jump, and I'm asking him, how much of the genome do you think is functional? Because the debate is on predictions and he doesn't know. Okay. Well, he doesn't understand the fact. And most of these evolutionists, unfortunately, don't understand the fact that if evolution is true, then yeah, most of the genome would be based on evolutionary leftovers. <laughs> We're predicting the opposite. So that's why I always say DNA function is key. Are these nested hierarchies there? Okay. Due to descent with modification. Or are these nested hierarchies functional hierarchies? Okay, there for a purpose. Um, so very good input, uh, Renwell. Um, let me see here. Okay. So, you know, this is good too. One, one famous example. Okay, Kenneth Miller. He testified that the human beta globin pseudogene is broken. So here's the point, guys. There's been a lot of so-called pseudogenes that have been overturned, that were used as like 100% demonstration for common ancestry, okay? But what's funny is newer studies have found that these examples used in the past have been overturned. For example, here, 2013 study in genome biology found that the beta globin pseudogene is functional due to its conserved sequence, which suggests a selectable function, making it less tolerant to muta mutations. The reason why, guys, that conserved sequences suggest function is because they haven't been obliterated by mutations. They're being conserved by selection essentially because they are important. If it was neutral junk, then it could, it could take a ton of mutations over time, okay? Because it's not that important to the genome. But if it's conserved over time, we see a lot of conserved regions in the genome in all of life right? So, so uh, suggesting that natural selection has preserved these genetic sequences. And there's another example too, egg, egg yolk pseudogene, okay, that has been used by Venema. And what's funny is 
This has also been overturned, okay? This is not a case where humans have a clear-cut, complete, non-functional pseudogene, clearly matching a functional gene in, in some related species. Venema has admitted we have what he calls pseudogene fragments. And by fragments, we're not talking about the large DNA sequences that clearly match large portions of the uh, egg yolk pseudogenes still retained in our chicken cousins. He knows that these are at best very small and tiny fragments of sequence. So a lot of times they're taking very tiny fragments, okay? And they're making conclusions based on their presuppositions on very limited data, okay? Which is not good science. Uh, so there's some articles that you can find on Answers in Genesis where the evolutionists have egg on their face essentially because this specific pseudogene has been shown to also uh, be important, okay? Also based on uh, flimsy evidence. So there's a ton here, guys, that I could uh, that I could go over, um, but you know I want you guys to also read through these number of papers here, okay? So I'm gonna stop screen sharing, and let's see what we're. So we're almost on two hours. I said we we're gonna go about an hour, but this is all too much fun. <laughs> So let's see. So still got 40 people in here almost. That's awesome. Doki Doki. David, good to see you. Great, uh, great debate the other day. Uh, David Neff. Yeah, Dr. Dan, I've already refuted him on genetic entropy so many times. That at this point, he's just, I mean, he literally denied the numerical simulations, okay, that have demolished mutation count mechanism. And his argument was, well, I don't care about those. And he's already backed down from Dr. Kevin Anderson months ago, which I got Jackson Wheat to do it instead, which was an awesome debate. So I'm glad that happened. Dr. Kevin Anderson is now ready for another debate which Dr. Dan was the first one I contacted to do the debate, to give him the choice to redeem himself, okay, from how he ran away from the first debate, and he has turned down that debate as well. So if he's so confident, um, then why is he turning down debates with PhD, Young Earth Creationist? Now, he'll say, oh, I've invited them onto my channel. Yeah, listen, okay, when you are known for dodging all the evidence, okay, dodging all the arguments, then that person needs to be addressed in a formal debate, okay? Not to just go on the channel where, so here's the thing, that opportunity is there. Um, but we actually have a lot of other good candidates for Dr. Kevin Anderson too. So we're going to have some fun. We got a lot of good stuff planned. Thank you, Nephilim Free Brother, for the super sticker. See, not, uh, genetic entropy, the evolutionists have to pretend not to understand it. Yeah, exactly. Here we go. Dr. Dan is a waste of time at this point. Doubling down Dan, okay? You know, he, 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 focuses, he focuses in on a very narrow topic. Okay, he gets, he gets demolished. But that's really all he has. So he has to double down on it instead of admitting that, okay, you know, these number of reasons why my argument are wrong, he has to just double down and, just, and pretend like those haven't actually demolished his argument. So um, Luca, Luca's the man. Hey, Luca, I want to thank you for joining us in an open mic the other night. Well, I should say now a week ago. Uh, Luca and I will be having a discussion cordial, respectful discussion next week on independent origins, biblical kinds. So I'm really, um, th th there's a couple other evolutionists too that I'm going to be setting up some discussions with here on this channel, which I'm looking forward to. I want to have more um, discussions such as that, where we are, you know, working to understand each other and not really feel like we're in debate mode, you know? So Luca and I are going to have some fun next week. Uh, sometime after the Matt Slick debate versus Dr. Ron Garrett. Now, here's the thing. Genetic entropy is not that hard to understand, but it destroys the naturalistic worldview, so they have to pretend that it doesn't exist. Guys, guys, the fact is mutations accumulate. 
And most of them cannot be filtered out by selection. The fact is, the junk DNA paradigm has been overturned. That means most of our genome is active, which means most of these mutations are deleterious, which means genomes are degrading. And as a result, it puts shelf lives on genomes. We could not have been here for millions and millions of years. End of story. But no, but no, they want to use arguments that assume the millions of years. They want to use arguments that ignore the numerical simulations. They want to use arguments that assume junk. Well, at the end of the day, they don't really have anything to offer against genetic entropy. So um, let's see. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I really enjoyed those Neanderthal debates, the Neanderthal phylogenetics. And, and here's what's funny about that is when it comes to the Neanderthals, when it comes to African genetic diversity, okay, when it comes to, let's say, the Neanderthal phylogenetics, okay, well, the fact of the matter, and specifically referring to my debates with Walker David Dan on it, which I really enjoyed, it all comes down to the fact that Neanderthals are exhibiting different sets of biodiversity compared to us, right? And when you start from the creation model, okay, and you understand that Neanderthals are earlier, okay, which means they started off different. <laughs> Not only that, when you consider patriarchal drive, okay, combined with Neanderthals being an early branch of man, living longer, which makes patri patriarchal drive an issue, okay, when Neanderthals were founded, they're already starting different, and now they're even more different because you've got a gigantic number of mutations being added to the genomics of these Neanderthal populations. So now they're already starting with a different set of biodiversity. Then you add in the fact that they have a separate history, okay, than your other subsets of humanity because of where they migrated to, and the fact that they are literally the most inbred people on the planet that have ever lived. You look at their runs of homozygosity and they have extremely high levels of homozygosity. These massive stretches of just identical letters in their genome. Okay. And the evidence would also seem to uh, be pretty strong based on the conditions that they lived in. Okay. That they could have had mutations in DNA repair enzymes, which I think is a pretty valid hypothesis. That would add more mutations. All of this happening independent of Homo sapiens, of your other Homo variants that would have dispersed to other parts of the planet. You know, all of these things considered give us exactly what we would expect to find in these phylogenetics. Okay, early man, the history of early man was chaotic, so it's hard to predict. But these reasons do explain the phylogenetics. But the, but here's the thing. They have to double down on it, you know, even though it's it's been explained. So the, those debates have been interesting. Um, okay, so let's see. Any last comments? Figured I'd take that last rabbit trail. Anyways, good. Good chat today. Luca, excited for our discussion. David, good to see you. Yeah, a very good debate with Bill. Very enjoyable. And any last questions here? Hate, love, nothing. Great to see you. Doki, doki. Last minute super sticker. I appreciate it. Well, I can hear the kids upstairs. It is getting close to dinner time. Hope you guys had fun. I think that was a thorough dismantling of biblical compromise and pseudo genes, guys. So share around. Neff, we got to do a stream soon, brother. We got some uh, evolution videos we should play and respond to. All right, guys. God bless. Oh, Pi373, $5 super chat. I appreciate it. Have you heard of or seen the fourth dimensional design of DNA video at the channel? Yes. Amen. Dr. Robert Carter. I've watched that video numerous times. I've played it during streams before. Uh, what I'll do is maybe the next stream I'll play that as well. See, the fact that the genome is 
fourth, it's got four dimensions. It's overlapping. It's nested. Okay. Um, makes the genome what's called polyfunctional, but polyconstrained is in any little change to the nucleotide sequence, no matter how small it is, will have what's called a ripple effect of negative effects. That's the problem the evolutionists have. Okay. Um, yeah, let's do that enough. No problem. Renwell, thank you for the input. Thank you for the input. Um, good questions from everybody. Good comment. Straight Talk TV. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. And Doki Doki Bible Club. So great chat today. Um, and I love when the evolutionists are in here too, or people of uh, differing views, because I think healthy discussion on these issues is important. Okay. And my only hope would be that people like William Lake Craig, when they put out videos like this, at least show the other side and at least show that you're updated on the science and updated on the data because he puts himself out there and these uh, biblical compromisers put themselves out there for being easily refuted as this was, you know? So I don't know if they're just hoping that, that we don't respond or we don't give counter rebuttals, but I've given a number of articles and papers that have not been responded to by the other side. So glad to see we're at two hours. We're still at over 30 people in the chat, but it is dinner time. Tony Lincoln, my brother, I appreciate it. I appreciate it. So tomorrow we'll have a debate. Got a couple debates this, this week and a bunch of things planned. So uh, stay tuned, guys, for some more announcements. Everybody, God bless. This has been fun as always, and SFT is out. For all those who appreciate the work that we're doing here on Standing for Truth, please hit that subscribe button.